Our scripture today is from the latter part of Luke chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 31. However, we will skip over two verses which have to do with Jesus' healing in the midst of a long Sabbath day of Simon's mother-in-law. We're going to reserve that little passage to Mother's Day in a few weeks. So, other than that, we are going to be reading the last portion, last couple portions of Luke chapter 4. Beginning at verse 31, hear now God's word. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, which we already know from Luke 4, he's been already basing his ministry out of Galilee. He talked about that when he preached at Nazareth. Now he's returning from Nazareth down to Capernaum. And it's literally down. He's going from well above sea level, the cliffs of Nazareth, down below sea level. Capernaum is below sea level on the Sea of Galilee. And he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Be gone, leave us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Now, when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Our youth are working their way through uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans, to the Roman church. And actually our youth just this past Wednesday night entered into studying uh, the beginning of uh, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 through 11, the apostle Paul goes into a major discourse on, well, what about Israel and what about the Jews? And what about the fact that many of the Jews are not believing? And what's God's plan? And is God faithful to his covenant? In the middle of that segment, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, you may know this verse. Paul, quoting from Joel chapter 2, verse 32, says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now that's good news, isn't it? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Romans chapter 10, that's very good news. And Paul is talking about it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, but the the key issue is to call upon the name of the Lord. However, let me pull back from that. I'll return to Romans chapter 10 towards the end of this sermon. But let me juxtapose the reality of the whole counsel of God and specifically juxtapose 
uh, what Jesus says toward the close of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus says this toward the Sermon on the Mount's conclusion. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So you need to read these two verses in conversation. It's not just an, a magic abracadabra, as long as I name Jesus, as long as I call on the name of the Lord, man, I'm, I got my ticket punched, baby, I'm in. That is not what the Bible is saying, and you can see that Jesus is clearly uh, disputing that. Which brings us then to another key verse that's a point of reference for going back into the passage that we just read. James chapter 2, verse 19. James says this, now this is to believers, to Jewish, primarily Jewish believers. He says this, you believe that God is one? He's kind of echoing the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is Echad, the Lord is one. Um, he says, you believe that? Good, but he's saying that sarcastically. Ha, that's why I threw that high in there. You, you do well. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. So just to give you a cue up front, the issues are going to include where your heart is and with whom your heart is, okay? Um, which is our sermon today, hellish belief, Lord save us. There can be hellish belief. Satan definitely believes in God. But he's not saved by that faith. It is not a heart that is set afire in the new birth, right? It's a, it's a heart that is set against God. Likewise, these other fallen angels, the demonic spirits at work in the spiritual warfare on earth. So, hellish belief, Lord, save us. Let's pull back and remember, last Sunday, on Easter Sunday, we particularly highlighted and went back to Temptations Numbers 1 and 3 in connection with what Jesus is saying and preaching and what happens to Jesus in Nazareth, his hometown. Today, let's look at the central temptation as Luke gives it to us, the second temptation. And what happens in that temptation? Jesus rejects, Jesus rejects the devil's offer of authority. I want you to catch that, of authority all the authority and all the glory that's exousion and uh, uh, doxon in Greek, okay? So you, you kind of need to know that first word, exousion. I'm going to come back to that. All the authority and all the glory of all worth, world's kingdoms throughout all history. Everything that we think that glitters and is gold, okay? <laughs> Jesus rejects all that. The offer that Satan gives him of Satan-given authority, the world's authority. Satan says, I can give you everything that everybody down here thinks is really important, okay? The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority, all this exousion, um, and, and their glory, their doxon, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now, we have Jesus rejecting the devil's offer of authority. Now, in the last part of Luke chapter 4, we have Jesus exerting his own authority. It's a different authority. It comes from heaven. Hellish belief, heaven-given belief. Hellish authority, heavenly authority. That's what's at play before us. This is what we see as Jesus' ministry develops. This is what God's word through Luke is telling us. So Jesus now asserts his authority in two key ways initially. With his word, with his word, number one, and with his actions or deeds, and specifically early on, deliverances from demonic possession and healings. Okay, other healings. Sometimes healings involve deliverance from demonic possession. Sometimes it's just flat-out healing. So Jesus, what is he doing? He is waging war 
on Satan's strongholds. So you get the big picture here. Jesus rejects Satan's offer of authority, and now he's going to go take the attack to Satan's authority, to Satan's strongholds in people's life, all in earth. And this is good news. For us to be saved, we need Jesus to do this and to lead with the word of God. You remember, of course, John 3.16. I think all of our children know John 16, 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then what's John 3.17? For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Now, that's great news. And you remember, with Jesus' quoting of Isaiah 61, he stops in the middle of verse 2 and doesn't talk about the vengeance of the Lord. But I mentioned to you the first time I preached on that, that doesn't mean that that's not... Some people read that and say, oh, Jesus is totally taking that off the table for his first coming. No, no, no. He's partially introducing it already, and he's going to take the vengeance of the Lord to sin, evil, and Satan. That's what the cross ultimately is all about. So then, the same author, John, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. What does he say in 1 John chapter 3? Well, let's look. Why did Jesus come? The reason the Son of God appeared was to what? The reason the Son of God appeared was to do what? Destroy the works of the devil. That is his first coming, his first appearance. John's telling us that. So he is waging war, Jesus says, on Satan's strongholds. Now this connects with Jesus' calling and the prophecies of Isaiah. Remember, we've talked about Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. That's all great news, right? That's the Beatitudes. That's wonderful. But look at this. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, in other words, with his word, he will kill the wicked. He will kill the wicked. Rasha. He'll kill him. What do we pray? Third petition for us in the Lord's Prayer. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. And what's the third one? Third and fourth, lead us not into temptation, but do what? Deliver us from evil, and literally, probably, from the evil one. So, we're talking here, then, about the authority and the priority of Jesus' word today. That's really what we need to understand front and center from this passage, as it applies to us as a church, and as it applies to you and me in our households, in our lives, outside of a few hours we spend together in church on Sunday morning. The authority and the priority of Jesus' word. Jesus' initial pronouncements about what his priority is and why he's here. Look at the, basically the close of Luke chapter 4. Why did Jesus come? Jesus says, I must do what about the good news? And what's the good news about? Let's fill in those blanks. I must preach. I must preach. Not think nice thoughts about. Not just sing about. Not just kind of pray in my prayer closet about. I must publicly preach the good news of what? The kingdom of God. To the other towns as well, because I was sent for this purpose. So in other words, how is it God so loved the world that he gave his one only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How is that plan executed? Jesus comes doing what? Preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And then look at his other initial purpose and priority pronouncement. We've already hit it in Luke chapter 4. Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to do what? To think nice thoughts? to be just a nice person and people will get the kingdom because they see my countenance and they can figure it out? No, no, no. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to announce good news, to evangelize to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. His ministry is centrally all about preaching. It's about public proclamation. This is central to Jesus' ministry. He's telling us this over and over again. Then Luke, by the way, as he closes out four, tells us that Jesus goes on and preaches in Judea. This is consistent. Jack, you'll like this with the gospel according to John. John makes it clear to us that in the first year of Jesus' public ministry, he's down in Judea too. Matthew and Mark are silent on that. Luke mentions this kind of as a footnote at the end of four. So what's the people's response? This is going to get, get, start getting kind of personal here. The people's response to Jesus' instruction. It's translated typically as teaching, but I put instruction to set it off for you. The word here is didache. The very first document that's not in the New Testament, that's the oldest document of the Christian church outside of the New Testament, is a document called the what? The didache. It means instruction, teaching. And the people, in response to Jesus' instruction about how they're supposed to live, about what the kingdom of God is about, is what? They are astonished. Why? Because his word possessed, there's that word again, exousia, authority. So, again, for us, what is first priority, top priority? for us as Christians. Yes, we're supposed to glorify God, but what's the essential link there? If we're truly to glorify God and his kingdom in our worship, in our fellowship, and in your daily life out in the world, the preaching and teaching of his word, of his gospel, of God's kingdom, and our hearing of it. You catch that? He preaches and we need to hear it. Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Actually receive it. Uh, these have top and central priority, what it means to be a church, what it means to come to worship, what it means to not just in worship on Sunday, though in your life. Let me ask you this. How important is the word of God in your Monday, in your Tuesday night? in your discussions with your children or grandchildren, with your spouse. You may want to revisit this because the message here is clear. The teaching, the preaching, and the hearing of God's word and being in God's word is front center. Do an honest assessment of your life right now and how you're spending your time. The word is front and center for Jesus. Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Now notice this is good news of the kingdom of God. This is not, let me kind of pick out a few verses that make me feel good or that apply to where I am right now. No, 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 this is actually the full gospel of the kingdom of God. I was sent for this purpose, Jesus says. Paul says, of course, the same thing. We see this all throughout his ministry. When he's leaving the uh, elders at the church at Ephesus, how does he describe? He says, I don't have blood on my hands because I preached the gospel to you. And then he says this, now, I know that none of you among whom I have preached the kingdom will see my face again. That's, in other words, when Paul sums up his entire time in Ephesus, the key thing is what? Preaching the kingdom of God. And then when you close out Acts, Paul lived in Rome. He's a prisoner for two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. What was Paul doing? Proclaiming the kingdom of God proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with boldness and without hindrance. The early church, Acts chapter 2, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' instruction. There's that word again, didache. And to the fellowship. This is, doesn't just mean like having a meal together. This means like being together. The koinonia and the breaking of bread and the prayers. So here's our prayer number one. It's in your notes. And I've got it up on the, on the screens for you. Lord, please let me not just be impressed or interested by your word. Remember, everybody in Capernaum is interested and imp impressed, astonished at his word. But we're going to learn later in the gospel that most of them don't become believers. It's not enough to be, that was an interesting thought. 
I'll think about that. Or, well, the pastor had a kind of encouraging point today. That's nice. That's not what we're talking about. Okay? Lord, please let me not just be impressed or interested by your word, but by your grace, let me be, what do you think goes in the blank there? Saved. Let me be saved by your word and lead me to do what? To live by your word. Lead me to live by your word. Let me be saved by your word and lead me to live by your word. Let's just pause and pray that right now. Oh, Lord, let me not just be impressed or interested by your word, but by your grace, let me be saved by your word and lead me to live by your word. Amen. Now, authority of God's kingdom. So Jesus wages war on Satan's strongholds, um, including and beginning in the synagogue. Now, this would be funny if it weren't so poignant or striking. Notice, does Jesus begin his big battle against satanic forces out at uh, a house of prostitution or at the casinos or at the ball games? No, where does he start? Where do, it kind of comes to him. The battle comes to him. Where does the battle come to him? In the church, <laughs> in, on Sabbath worship, in the synagogue. Y'all catching this? And, and this guy, for all we know, has been coming to church or to synagogue for weeks, months, or years. And there's never been an issue because most of the rabbis, you know, they teach, they tell a few slogans, they make you feel good, go out and have a great day, and let's get out of here. You know, we're on a clock here, baby. Let's get out of here. Jesus goes over, apparently. Jesus goes over both quantitatively, like he actually preaches, and his message is one of authority. And suddenly, the demon who possesses this man can't take it anymore. I got things to do and people to see. Who are you? What are you doing? Get, leave us alone, Jesus. This is what the demon says in response to this. Leave us alone. What have you to do with us? Now, the us is quizzical there because there's only one demon in this possessive situation. Is the demon trying to defend other demons? That's one reading. Or is he def trying to defend his nice little congregation so they can stay the same? You hear what I'm saying? This is deep stuff here. The demon says, leave us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? You don't belong in Capernaum. We had a nice little church thing going here in Capernaum. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And then later, when Jesus is laying hands on folks and healing them, in some cases they're demonically possessed, and the de demons also come out crying, you are the Son of God. So let's look at the demons' response. The demons know and what? The demons believe, just like James is talking about. The demons believe. Oh, yeah, they believe he's the Son of God. Oh, yeah, sure. Does that save you? No, not in their case. That's hellish belief. They know who Jesus is, and they call on his name. That's what the demons do, just like James says. So the demons acknowledge and call on Jesus' name as the Holy Son of God and the Christ. What's their agenda? They're trying to manipulate Jesus. In the spiritual realm and in the ancient realm, if you can know and use somebody's name on them, you have power over them. That's the way they think. That's the way they thought in the ancient world. And Jesus is having none of it. What about some folks who call themselves Christians? Oh, yeah, I can slap Jesus at the end of my prayers and get him to leave me alone and just support what I want to do. That's basically what the demons are saying. Look, look we'll say who you are. Just let us keep doing our thing. God forbid, right? Um, Jesus rebukes the demons for their hellish belief or faith and their use of his name. He's had enough of this. And by the way, he does not want them as his witnesses to the world. <laughs> he doesn't need the demons to be evangelists for him because they're not going to really be evangelists, right? And his disciples don't understand this yet. That's, that's going to come later. Remember, Simon's going to confess, right? That's going to come later. So... 
As James says, you believe God is one, you do well. Yeah, ha. Even demons believe and shudder. Okay. One note on Jesus that is just so beautiful here. Notice the way he lays his hands on everyone who comes to him for healing. Did y'all hear that? He lays his hands on every single one. So I want you to hear this. In the midst of all this spiritual warfare we're talking about, if you will simply come to Jesus, he will lay his hand on you and heal you. And if you need to be delivered, he will say the word and it's done. What an awesome savior. So our prayer Gracious Lord, it's kind of like the first one, but a little bit different. Please do what? You know how to fill in this blank. Please save me from hellish belief. I don't want to be like one of those demons who calls on your name, but it's to get my way and to have you basically leave me alone. I'll get back with you, Jesus, when I have another problem and I'll get lost. No, no, no. I don't want to call on Jesus that way. Lord, please save me from hellish belief and from the hellish use of your name. Please give me new life, saving faith by your word and spirit. Now let's go back to Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Look back at verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. Do you all see that? That is going to be the key difference. That doesn't just mean superficially in your heart and mouth. That means deeply in. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, everyone see that? With the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. This is a different kind of mouth. This is a different kind of testimony and what the demons are doing. It's clear when we read all this together, this is what this is talking about. What we are looking towards is the promise in Isaiah and definitely in Jeremiah of the new covenant, the new testament. God says, yes, I will do what Deuteronomy was talking about. I will give you a new heart. I will take out your hardened heart. I will take out your cancerous, sin-ridden heart, and I'm going to give you a new heart. You're going to be born again in Jesus by the Holy Spirit you're gonna get a new heart. And with that new heart, you truly can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. You truly can know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So now, let's move to our final prayer here now. With that understanding of the heart, I invite you to pray this with me. Gracious Lord, please save me from hellish belief from any hellish use of your name. Please give me a new heart and a true testimony of new life saving faith by your word and by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. Gracious God, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever, amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.